No. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Zero Interest. This time we're looking at Ruby episodes 13 and 14, Forever yep, 4, forever four. 1 and 2. So. We have, we start with, hey, they're in, they're in, it's, we're in John's room, and it's his team, and Nora's bouncing on the bed like an adorable little bunny, mm. but she's not the real bunny girl, so it doesn't matter. How come John gets home so late? He's become rather scarce ever since he's been fraternizing with Cardi. Anyways, he's been scarce lately. That yes. John guy. Scars? No, no. No, not scarce. Scarce isn't here. Scarce. That's what I'm going to say. Because I'm an American, and my job is to bastardize the language. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> yeah. He he's been going out a lot, and we what the heck is up with Sean? And John's uh, we we cut to John. Basically, he's he's coming in rather late, and Ruby's like, "Hey, what you doing?" And he's like, "Oh well, you know, um, yeah, okay. Look, I'm a failure. I am a failure. I've been letting down my team. I've been." I don't. I don't belong here. I just. I'm. I'm. I'm a failure. And he. He just opens up. Hmm. And Ruby's like, nope. Literally, what she not, says. Nope. Nope. You're not allowed to be a failure. But but what I I am. But nope. 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 You're a leader now, Jean. You're not allowed to be a failure. Does it matter if you're a failure now? Or if you, it doesn't matter if you're a failure as a kid or if you're a failure the first day. Can't be a failure now. Nope, you have a team. You have responsibilities. You have to be better for their sake and not just for you. It's not all about you. So, nope. Can't be a failure. This and, also, again, I hate this arc. I really do. But this also was a very good character moment because it's established that Ruby's already been taught this lesson. Yeah. So now she's teaching it to someone else. I'm moving yeah. my hands across the desk, but it's below the camera line, so I can't actually show it. But it that's it what I'm works. Doing. It's sort of up there. It works well for for how these characters now are playing off each other, and I really like this moment. So then we cut to oh hey, uh, he opens up his thing, and it's like oh hey, it's me, Cardin. Go get some dangerous uh, creatures. Yeah, I, I I need your help to go get those. Hmm. Like, okay. Uh. Then we cut to a field trip. They're going to Forever Fall. Yes, students, the forest of Forever Fall is indeed beautiful, but we are not here to sightsee. You gotta collect the, the, the sap from the trees and the honey and the whatnot, and you I gotta forget, get... I forget why this was important as part of their hunter education, but whatever. And, and they have... Good witch, just like I'm here to make sure you guys don't die. Hmm. Just get your your stuff and go. And I'm like, okay, cool. This sounds like just a fun field trip for the sake of having fun. And also, there might be monsters. I don't know. I don't know how this contributes to anything, but it's good and it's fun. Hmm. And so, John's obviously in the back carrying a big thing of jars because Cardin's a, a dick. Come on, buddy, let's go. So, so you know, Pierre gives him that one like look of, oh, I don't, I, I, I will break his legs. Just, I will break his legs. You know, if you would just tell me, I'd break his legs. And I think she says that earlier, even. Mm, uh, she does. Yes. Yeah, I, w I would break his legs. Uh, so Zahn has to go and collect six jars for all these. For this jerk and his friends. It's like, why six jars when there's only five of us? Well, Johnny boy, you'll see. And then they brings it over. It's like, well, you see, these particular uh, <laughs> these particular creatures that we that you got for me love sweets. 
and we have a jar of some sweet, sweet nectar that we can throw on your girl, Pira. Because she humiliated me in class, and I'm petty. Hmm. And what and, eventual. Yeah. And he's like, well, John, you're going to throw it at her, because I can't afford to do it myself, because I'm lazy. And John lifts up the jar, and I'm like, if he throws that jar, if he actually throws that jar, and then he doesn't, and I'm like, thank you. No. Good boy. Good boy. Mm. If you were to throw that jar, your entire character would be dead to me. Good boy. And so he's like, no. And that's what gets him to stand up for to the bullies, is that his team was in, endangered from these rapier wasps, is what they were called. Hmm. Which is a very scary name. It is. It's terrifying. <laughs> As someone that's scared of wasps, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I've seen some pretty bad wasp nests, and I, I and I I am terrified of wasps as well. But rapier, adding in like, a sword to the name, like if you were to just like say it's a scimitar wasp, I'd still be scared. I don't know. I it's, mean, rapier is it's a stabby weapon. A scimitar yeah. is a slashy weapon. It wouldn't have. I know, effect. but isn't that more scary that it can slash you? No, because a rapier wasp implies that the stinger is like a foot long or something stupid. Yeah, true. Mm, that's scary. <laughs> I'm I'm not a fan of the concept. Just in general. <laughs> Claymore wasp. Anyways, moving on to part two Thank of you. this. Thank <laughs> uh, We have. Hey, let's just beat up Jean now because he said no, and saying no is wrong. So, punchy punch punch, and they're hitting him, and then he's just like, "Don't mess with my team. Just you can't like, don't mess with my me or my team ever." And so they're beating the crap out of him, and then all of a sudden his aura activates, and he's able to just kind of knock the guy away and heal himself, and then. Uh, he throws the the jelly. Earlier, uh, actually, I forgot to mention this. Yeah. Earlier, he'd thrown the jelly instead of at Pira. He'd thrown it at Cardin, right? Yep, that's right. And so this the jelly attracts this big Winnie the Pooh mofo grim. Mm. And... This, this this honey right here, and since it's my job to do this, I have to say the name of that grim is an Ursa Major. So this Winnie the Pooh right here mm. comes on over, and he just proceeds to bat everyone out of the way, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna eat your chest because it's covered in honey." And then Cardin's like, "Oh no!" and he runs away, and he starts running, and his weapon gets knocked out of the way. And then we cut over to. Point uh, I'll... Not sure whether it's implication or retcon, but um, Grim don't eat at all. That's not a thing they do. They don't need to. They don't. Why is it attracted to sweets then? It isn't. Another one of those things that the World of Remnant episodes establishes more about the behavior of Grim. They are attracted to negative emotions, which still makes sense in this scene because Jean is being very positive. But Cardin's team are fucking furious. Mm-hmm. So... Boy, does it want that that Cardin meal. Yeah. Cardin to go. Uh, so, the, the, the other boys run away, and they're like, Oh, no, there's a big Ursa! Oh, no! That's a big Ursa! Oh, no! And then all the Ruby team and... The rest of By John's the way, team is like when when when, <laughs> when the guy that voices voices Russell Thrush, the greenhead mohawk guy. Yeah. Um, the guy that voiced him was one of the animators, I think, mm-hmm. Daniel something. Uh, I yeah. Forget. Uh, he isn't a voice actor. He didn't really want to be a voice actor. So when he was asked to do that line, he was like, oh, "That's a big person," and did it as fucking stupidly as he <laughs> possibly could. 
just intentionally. Oh no, that's a big Ursa. Oh yeah. no. Basically. And so they're running and then Pierre's like, Jean, we gotta go save him. And so the they run, and some of the others are going to be like, yeah, let's go and get the good witch. She can handle this. And so they run over, and they see that uh, Jean is, like, jumps in the way to, with his shield to save Cardin because he's a good guy. Hmm. And he's a hero. Mm-hmm. And Boy, does that hero ideology play in here a bit. And then he goes full Dark Souls and starts to roll around. And then he gets hit. And he gets hit again. Hmm. Then he hits, gets hit again. And then you're like, okay, well, you're running low on your aura again. And so he runs and he goes to attack. And Pyrrha uses her dark power called Polarity, which... I saw a hand, and then, like, a dark energy was, like, covered. It was like, uh, is this, what, what's this, what's this? And she later explains this polarity. Because <laughs> so I, was, I was like. Yeah. And, and, um... and Magnetism corrects his shield, so he blocks the, the Winnie the Pooh's claw. Yeah, and to then continue he... the Dark Souls metaphor, he forgot to repost first before doing the strike, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Parry. Sorry, blocks I'm it. Getting my terms wrong. Parry, then repost. Yeah, parry. And then so she uses um, the power of magnets and magneto to correct his shield so that he can behead the Ursa. And yay! Look at that blood. You actually killed something, Jean. I think that's the first time you've killed something this entire show. Yep. In Pretty fairness, cool, though. There have only been, like, six fights in the entire show, so... I know. But it, it was pretty cool. And then, uh... And then everybody's like... And then Ruby and Vice are like, what was that? And Pyrrha's like, well, you know, you have your speed and you have your blitz. And this glyphs. is my thing. No, not, glyphs. Not blitz. Glyphs. Blitz. Glyphs. Whatever. You have your glyphs. And, well, I have my thing. And it's polarity. And and then I... I, I that was a really fun joke. Just, you can control poles? Yes. <laughs> and then Vice is like, no, you dumb. It means that she can control magnets. And then... And then, and then Ruby's like, magnets are cool. Mm. And, and just like, the way that line was delivered just cracked me up so much. That's pretty good. <laughs> Ruby's voice actor is pretty good. Uh, um, and then... Yeah, so this is, the, this is the third superpower that they did not establish very well at all. But um, yeah, this is called Semblance. Basically, yeah. if Aura is the expression of the soul, as Pyrrha explained in a few episodes ago... Um, semblance is basically that expression of the soul placed on the world around them so yeah everyone has a different one more or less there are it's somewhat it's, hereditary but not really it's your unique superpower basically, basically yeah it, it, it's your quirk for if those like, who are yes. fans of my it, hero it academia basically exactly like quirks except you have to work to get it, basically. Which is like another quirk. Uh, yeah, 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 stretching too much. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, so then we we cut over to the rooftop, and John's like, "Yeah, I was really prideful and dumb, and I'm sorry about that. Mm. I I was being an idiot, and then I had the the." scene in my mind from Doctor Strange, which is TEACH ME! You know? Mm. And, uh, so... Also makes sense, because, you know, Pyrrha is going to be teaching him how to fight with a sword and shield, and they both happen to be used, well, hers can turn into a javelin also, but it's sword and shield still. And she's also, like, won a bunch of 
tournaments and awards, and she's really kind of good at everything. Sure. Well, okay, that, that expression means that there's going to be a bit more to her character, which is good, because I was having the the problem of what, what I, you know, she's there a lot mm. in these episodes, but we don't see much of her personality wise other than she just really wants to help John a lot hmm. which is a bit boring like when she seemed miffed when he just kind of cast her off like that and said I don't need your help yeah. I felt like we could get something more there but we didn't overall in general this arc was there was like really good moments there were a few really good moments, and I was there like, were. "That, that is good writing." I forgot how many good moments there were, to be perfectly honest, because the rest of it was so rubbish. <laughs> it's like there are some really good moments, but it's like, but you, you could have done better in a lot of the other parts, and you could have made this an amazing little arc instead of a uh, kind of a shallow uh, bare bones uh, bully arc. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it is it is very bare bones, and it's the parts that where they really play off what makes these characters so unique and the lessons they've learned and everything that really have it stand out. But those parts are are very hard to find amidst all the just standard bulliness. Mm. It, it's like a diamond in the rough, basically. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Zero. You have now officially passed the worst part of this entire series. Oh. Wow. That wasn't bad at all. Yeah. I mean that that I mean it was like disappointing, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. So there you go. Only up from here. Is you, you you talked about oh Jean has some has some bad stuff and I was like, oh well you know, it can't be that bad. Uh but Alright. Yeah. Yeah. And in general, just, uh, I don't see Cardin coming back because he has, like, no character. He, he... There is an episode in season two where he comes back, but doesn't have any lines, and it's just sort of there to be an opponent. There Which is an sucks episode be... in season three where he's not there, but two of his teammates are. That's it. That's all he's it in the show. It sucks because the reformed bully is such a good character. It is. It's it's a fun character to use, but because then you like, there's a lot of just character interaction and stuff you can get out of there, hmm. and even if you don't want to make that character like a main character, they do help to define your the character you do want to focus on. Yeah, like for example, how does John interact with Carden now? Yeah, uh, is he still cool? in his dealings with Cardin? Is, is he forgiving? Is he just an absolute shit to him in return? Don't know. In in Persona 3, uh, Fuko, uh, or Fuka, sorry. Hmm. Fuka That's is getting... Game that we're about to record. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's all that conception. Uh, Fuka is bullied by, uh, you know, this girl, and they have the whole thing where she has to save her basically from the shadows yep. and the end result is that we we learn some stuff about why that bully acted the way that bully did was that she had just a bad family and it, it led to her frustrations and she got out of control yeah, and she's actually she a really nice person felt she had to take those frustrations out on something and Fuka was yeah. a, Fuka you know, was an easy yeah. target and, and so yeah, and then they eventually become friends, and Fuka, who had, like, no friends, ends up having a ton of friends by the end of the game. Yeah. That was a good so arc, and it was good having the interactions after the fact, after the bully yeah. was no longer a bully, that gave the entire thing more depth than it already had. It's just a wasted opportunity in this case, and it's disappointing, Yeah, but we can move on from it. Yeah, and this is still the first season. It is. Like, they're, these people are, are still, I'd say, that this this concept and, and this the writers feel like they're not really used to dealing with 
something of this scale that's original mm. without having to rely on uh, tropes and whatnot to help them along when they're struggling. Yeah, I mean, the writers for the show, I mean, Monty was the creator and he had a lot of broad stroke ideas on how he wanted the story to go. Mm -hmm. Uh don't take this as gospel because I don't exactly know the inner workings of Rooster Teeth, but I'm going to say that Miles and Carrie, the writers, were more integral for just writing the events in detail. Mm -hmm. So they, at least Miles, also wrote the season 9 and 10 uh, prequel arcs for Red vs. Blue. And it was... Yeah. Not quite the same, but it was similar in certain ways. It was there were a lot of similar themes going on in that story. Um, yeah, but what what I what I can see though is that they, they wrote season nine and ten of Red vs. Blue, right? The freelancer stuff. Yeah, that was all CG. But that's after eight seasons of Red vs. Blue. This was all characters that we basically hadn't seen at all. Yeah, like so. This was all completely new characters that they spent a lot of time developing mm -hmm. and having a lot of interactions that built the characters into what, you know, the ones that actually showed up in the series previously, we find out how they got where they did. And it's because mm -hmm. of these characters that we didn't see at all. Yeah. So they have written this sort of thing before to an extent, but they were also working with a lot of a lot of the details didn't have to be established like the setting or you know why they're fighting and all this stuff didn't have to be established like, they were fine this this is the first season of an original series yep and so you can't necessarily translate everything you've learned up till now to this unless you've done a lot of first seasons of original stories yeah and so it's it's a learning experience, is what it it, it feels like, because yeah. there there is there are some genuinely good moments thus far, and you know there, there's parts where I feel like the authors themselves didn't necessarily know where exactly they were going to go, and so that's why they they felt like oh well he's bullied well let's just go with the bully trope, yeah because they they don't know exactly how that will fit in further down the line and they can't exactly plan for that. Yeah. I mean, I think this first season would have been helped a lot if they had a longer running time. Not oh, damn. episode to episode, I mean just like the full season, if they maybe had a couple more episodes where they didn't have to rush to explain Aura. They didn't have to drop semblances on us with like a ten second explanation. And that means they would have the time for these proper explanations of the world and how it works and how they, f they fight and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And we could have the character moments that establish them as more than just the bully. But they didn't get that. You, you... In the first season, it was something new that they'd never tried before. Yeah. So they didn't have all the faith in the world in it. So they were trying it and seeing whether it stuck. And it did. And, yeah, and like... Every everybody's first chapter, first thing, is going to be not something you're going to be proud of. Mm. I mean, look at Team Four Star. They have their uh, Dragon Ball Z abridged. They hate their first couple episodes. They were not great. They were very, very in joke. It's... Like I enjoyed them when I was younger, but I can't necessarily go back and watch them all. Mm. You know, and they. Like they actively like they did a whole when they were doing their their Tiba thing they were they did a whole thing on their own first episode and said this is awful this is awful this is awful mm. we're much better now and I feel like that's where Ruby's going to go yeah basically so because of the promise that it will get better that I I've received mm. I am willing to continue but if I was watching this normally like, just week to week, mm. I don't necessarily think there's enough to compel me to keep watching, Definitely. other than uh, 
the promise of maybe a tournament arc, which you said isn't until season three. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, Bunny Girl. Yes, there's a Bunny Girl. <laughs> yes, Australian Bunny Girl. That that convinces me. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, joking aside, though, it is probably, like, I'd, I'd put it slightly above where I put it last time. We we did a general evaluation of the series hmm. where I said it was above average. Uh, like, if that was, like, a 6 out of 10, I'd bump it up to a 7 hmm. just from what I've seen. So uh, that's enough to keep you watching. Fair play. Well... It it the the problem is like if seven could keep me watching if there was something about this that I genuinely wanted to know more about and keep me interested in mm. they the, the just the brushing over auras and the brushing over semblances yeah, that doesn't help it's it's not enough mm. like you need a full episode devoted to each of those concepts they basically do that starting from season two they have basically world building episodes the world of remnants that i talked about previously that's basically what they are they'll dedicate say five six minutes videos to establishing a certain facet of the world they do one on dust they do one on grim they do one each for each of the different kingdoms they do one for menagerie the faunus land they do one on fauna right. specifically they do start doing that and it was such a fantastic thing for people that actually wanted to know more about about the setting and about the series and maybe wanted to write something themselves for example then it it was very very welcome <laughs> i feel like uh I, I i i am gonna reference naruto a bit but uh regarding the the whole semblances and auras thing when, when we had when we watched like naruto early naruto we had a very small team and we focused and we learned about them. Mm-hmm. And then the tuning exams came. Mm-hmm. And then we could see, okay, here's all the other characters we, we saw briefly. Here are their powers. And that was like, okay, these characters are all cool. Yeah. But, like... I mean, it, we did briefly see all these other characters that we would learn about in the tuning exams. But they weren't really developed yeah. at all. They were just there. Almost as placeholder characters, more or less. Yeah. And then they were established further down the line. They gave the main, main cast time to establish themselves before establishing everything else. Yeah, and you use, you use the tournament arcs. Tournament arcs are great for bringing in a bunch of new characters. They widen and the world. Just, yeah. Because you can see, like tournaments, they bring in other people from other parts of the world. So you can just have the whole thing expand just based on the characters that they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. So that's one that tournament arc. I feel like they should have. I feel like they're getting in, they got into way too many characters before that arc, mm. and I feel like if they had kept it more focused on just Team Ruby, and they do a few missions together or something, right? We do it. We take a little bit of inspiration from Naruto, early Naruto, not yeah. when it gets bad, and. See and learn about these characters and see them really grow up and connect to each other. And then we have that tournament arc and it's like, oh, this is what this person's semblance is. And this is what this person can do. And here's a little bit about each of these characters that you'll get to know over the rest of the series. Hmm. It's, it's, it's a, it feels like a the, the structure has a few problems, is it what does. I'm saying. I just noticed you've been wearing the captain's hat for the entire video. Yes, I have. I it's very com- forgotten about it. <laughs> it's very comfortable. Mm, okay. So it's probably my most comfortable hat, to be honest. Mm. Uh, so that was the conclusion of the bullying of Jean de Arc. Mm. Uh, Jean of Arc, uh, and. Boy, we're we're getting close to uh, the end here yep. of season one. Two more episodes. 
and then we get to where it apparently will start to get good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say now we're going to do the last two episodes separately because they are 10 and 15 minutes uh, each. So we're going to do... Sorry, my Skype overlay came up because I moved the mouse accidentally. Um, we're going to do this separately because there is a lot of... There's a lot of meat to these last two episodes, even beyond the fact that they're a lot longer than most of the episodes of this season. So we'll be doing episode 15 that was called... I forget what it was called. It wasn't called The Stray, was it? That might have been 16. I think that's I think that's The Stray. I would check for you, but I have already closed the tab that had the videos. Yeah, it would uh, be very useful if there was someone here that could sort of, I don't know, vamp and just talk while you were doing stuff and figure yeah. things out for if, you. But... If only there was somebody like that who could actually, yeah, it is called The Stray in Thank episode you. 16. is black and white. There you go. Okay, so guess who the last episode focuses on? <laughs> uh, hmm. It focuses on uh, racial tensions. Actually, yes, but... <laughs> what? No! That was... That, no! It's not what I meant. Okay, well... It wasn't, but you're not wrong. It's, you know... <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh... I think that's it for now, guys. Uh, we are having lots of... Audience, I hope you lost your shit when he said racial tensions, because that was too perfect. <laughs> That he not only was joking, but got it right. That was great. Uh, okay. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, thanks for watching this episode. Uh, we'll be back next week with the next one for the closing arc of the season. And then we'll move on to season two and do the fun stuff where it actually yeah. gets better. Yay. Yay! Boy, this season feels short. It does when you actually do the episodes as they should have been. It's only like ten episodes. Mm. Mm, so it goes. Yep. Bye. Bye, guys.